does in, you know, laryngitis, and this has happened before where it took weeks mm. for me to get my voice back. Yeah. And, you know, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't happy about that at all. Yeah, be on the vigil. Good evening, this is The Daily Drum for Wednesday, March 13th. Here's what's happening. The House has approved a bill that could lead to the forced sale or nationwide ban of social media app TikTok. In a rare bipartisan vote, two thirds of House members moved the bill to the Senate where it faces an uphill climb. And it's not about TikTok, it's about ByteDance. Foreign adversaries like the Chinese Communist Party pose the greatest national threat of our time. President Biden has said he would sign it if passed by the Senate. The bill requires TikTok's parent company, Chinese-owned tech giant ByteDance, to sell the app within 180 days or ban it from U.S. app stores. Lawmakers are concerned the Chinese government can access the personal data of millions of Americans. Those opposed to the bill argue... It imposes limits on free speech. Laurel police have identified two D.C. men killed in a shooting at a recording studio yesterday morning. 23-year-old Louis B. Rackett and 21-year-old Quincy P. Green Jr. were shot and killed at the track house studios on Lafayette Avenue. A third man is recovering from gunshot wounds. Police continue the search for suspects. The founder of the LGBTQ nonprofit Casa Ruby begins home detention at a family member's home in Rockville today. Ruby Corrado is awaiting trial for alleged fraud and money laundering. Yesterday, the judge agreed with defense attorneys who said the transgender woman would not be safe in DC's men's jail. Corrado was arrested last week after absconding to her native El Salvador in 2022. Six charges against former President Trump and other defendants in the Georgia election interference case have been dismissed. The judge dropped charges of solicitation to violate oath of office by a public officer. The rest of the 41-count indictment remains intact. The same judge says he will decide on Friday if Fulton County DA Fonny Willis stays on the case following allegations of conflict of interest. And 300 trees, including 140 cherry trees, will be removed from the Tidal Basin and West Potomac Park. Mike Litterist with the National Park Service says it's part of a project to rehab crumbling seawalls. We are losing cherry trees every year due to the flooding, and they can't be replaced because the flooding is still, is still taking place. So, you know, we will rebuild, reconfigure the seawalls. We're going to anchor them in bedrock, which was not done originally, so they won't settle anymore. We're going to raise them to a level that uh, the, the rising sea level um, won't come over the, uh, the, the walls. The trees will be replanted once the three-year project is complete. Meanwhile, the cherry trees remain on track to reach peak bloom within the next two weeks. Here's a look at our weather now tonight. Mostly clear with lows near 50 tomorrow. Partly to mostly sunny with highs in the upper 70s. Coming up, join us at the Reporters Roundtable as we analyze some of the top stories of the week. Insight is next on WHUR and WHUT-TV.
On the go and on demand, WHUR and WHUT are with you. Download the WHUR app today to get full access to shows, playlists, and our latest contests. To access WHUT on demand, download the PBS app and make Howard University Television your station. Catch up on our WHUT original productions anytime, anyplace on YouTube at WHUT TV. WHUR and WHUT better together. You may have noticed something different on Monday nights at 8 p.m. on WHUT. We like to call it Must See DMV. As part of our mission to amplify your stories on your station, you'll get to see some of the finest works from our creators who call D.C., Maryland, and Virginia home. It's Must See DMV, Monday nights starting at 8 p.m. right here on WHUT, Howard University Television. Welcome back to the Daily Drum on WHUR, <laughs> WHUT TV, and Sirius XM Channel 141. This is the Inside Segment. I'm Harold Fisher. We are at the Reporters Roundtable taking a look at some of the top stories of the week. My guests are Sonia Ross, editor in chief of Black Women Unmuted, and Darren Snyder, columnist with. The Grio. Thank you so much for coming in, guys. I appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, so let's first of all talk about this TikTok mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> because, um, you know, the, the TikTok dances notwithstanding, the thing that really surprised me today was the overwhelming number of both Republicans and Democrats supporting uh, this bill to either, you know, trash the app or make sure that ByteDance, uh, the Chinese company, sells it. Mm -hmm. The propaganda concern is real. Don't you understand that? When you say that, what do you mean? <laughs> uh, we have a rapid, rapid spread of disinformation online. African Americans are routinely targeted for that. And guess who's very active on TikTok? Guess who a lot of the content creators are on TikTok? Uh, we guess, are. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> guess, and, and guess what? TikTok is considered a news disseminating platform. Increasingly, uh, more people are getting their information from TikTok. They'll mm -hmm. go to TikTok looking for information. And let's not miss the importance of how fast you can reach people on TikTok and how broad that reach is. I mean, we saw Risa Tisa. Yes. Reached millions yes, of people. Yes, yeah, yeah. who, who, who the order. blank did I marry? Yes, yeah. yes, mm. yes. in short order. But uh, myth busting and the election and all kinds of things like that are out there on TikTok. People rely on that platform. So the concern is great and understandable when you look at the condition of U.S.-China relations. But that argument could also be used for, for social media in general, we remember what happened during the 2016 election with, um, you know, the Russian interference and, and, mm -hmm. and everything else. So is that, you know, Darren, where we are right now, not just with, with TikTok, but social media in general? Because, and again, as, as Sonia just said, um, a growing number of people are getting their news and information from social media, whether it's Instagram or Facebook, of, co of course, both owned by Meta. Twitter. Uh, Twitter yeah. or X. Yeah. Twitter. Um, Twitter. And, uh, and, and, and TikTok. So is it just, you know, two sides of the same coin? Not really, because the, the fact of the matter is it's a Chinese-owned company. So then you have the whole national security threat, um, you know, these other companies are owned domestically. So one part of the conversation is the effect of social media on discourse and misinformation. But this is a whole separate issue. It's like, who owns this company and what could they do with the information they have if they wanted to? So the fear from everyone voting for it is like, China at any moment can just tell ByteDance, hey, give us everything you got on these Americans. And ByteDance, unlike American companies, would just happily comply. Well, maybe not happily, but 
they'll comply. Mm -hmm. They'll be forced to comply. Yeah. So it's an easy um, stance to get behind from a national security point of view because you don't trust China. We don't mm -hmm. trust China with access to all of this data on all these millions of Americans on this platform. China loves the fact that we're all on it, I think, because they can help foster misinformation. They can keep tabs on what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, they could, if they wanted to, ask the company for data that in this company, in this country, it wouldn't fly. So I understand why so many politicians are saying, like, mm -hmm. it's not so much that they have a problem with TikTok. They got a problem with China owning the company that owns TikTok. I mean, it's a built-in GPS to American public sentiment. You want to know where the people of this country uh, stand on whatever? Hit TikTok, and in a few minutes, you will have the whole array of opinion. And that, in turn, can give the purveyors of, of disinformation an idea of what to plant, where, and how. See, but they know, they know that anyway. All you got to do is just watch. So you can just be yes, on but it. They right? don't have to work that hard to get it on TikTok. Right, but I mean, you can just get on TikTok and see, wow, they think this, that, the other, the other. It's not that because you know, have open society, you know, the spies look at the news too. And mm -hmm. so, but the fact that they can get the data yes, that is, correct. that's the, the that's problem. That's the thing, that's, that's the, the problem. I, to, to your point, Sonia, also, um, where, where you're talking about not only them getting you know, information about about Americans and and the the that critical population. Half of the country, 170 million people, mm -hmm. are on tit on, on TikTok on, in one way or another. But the I think the the other you know the other issue is with them getting and this is a broader issue about our business of you know of the news business the you know where is walter cronkite where you know where are the you know the straight shooting news organizations and and with uh tiktok and and the users getting their information from tiktok or from facebook or from Instagram, like I said, we're right back in, at you know at 2016, where you know someone who can, you know, uh, drop a, a misinformation, disinformation, news depth charge, mm -hmm. and and really impact those that that 170 million Americans. Well, we got a zillion little Walter Cronkites out there, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing. I mean, everybody, it, the news has become so compartmentalized and driven by ideology from jump that everybody just sort of picks their self-designated Walter Cronkite and they go with it, mm -hmm. you know? There's some Walter Reed Cronkites out there. <laughs> Walter Reed, Walter Reed, Walter Reed Cronkite. We, we, have, we have an array of of um, news disseminators out there. A large number of them accurate, on point, ha have a point of view. I mean, you've mm -hmm. got two. You've got Walter and Walterine Cronkite right here at your table with you, mm -hmm. you see. So and that's the way I see it. <laughs> that, <laughs> right? that, 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 and and that's the way it is. But see, I believe you. <laughs> I trust you. <laughs> and in many ways, that's mm -hmm. a saving grace when you get right down to it. But the, um, whole, the whole thing, though, because, you know, you got these bots that are programmed by bad actors trying mm -hmm. to stir up dissent, stir up um, angst and all of these things. And the company, you know, Meta and whoever these other, they're not really, they're saying, hey, you know, we, they're not really controlling it. And we're just kind of living with the fact that we know there's a lot of bad actors, misinformation, disinformation. That's part of the deal with, with this social media. You know, you have legacy institutions on there, they, legitimate news organizations, um, public, organiza public um, offices. So a lot of accurate, verifiable information, and we just understand you gotta take the other stuff with it. But with China owning it though, then, you know, that's... There's something kind of greasy about yeah, that. Yeah, gre greasy with a Z. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but here, here's the other, the, the final question about this particular topic. Let us say that this passes the Senate and ByteDance decides to sell 
TikTok to an American company within the, the 180 days that this bill is asking. And of course, if it passes the Senate and I should say, and President Biden signs it, uh, are you at all concerned about who can afford to buy it? I mean, you know, would it be, you know, Elon Musk? Would it be Jeff Bezos? Um, we are talking what could very well be the, the biggest social media purchase ever. And there may be less to be concerned about if a Jeff, Jeff Bezos buys it, since, of course, he owns the Washington Post. But Elon Musk, not so much. The usual suspects, I think, will be lined up. I think Elon Musk is looking at, he's kicking the tires on Truth Social, so maybe he's, maybe he's preoccupied. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, if he, if he put a bid in on it, would I be crazy about it? No, mm. not really. I mean, the other Bezos or Zuckerberg, I mean, they already own, what, 90% of it anyway, so... How much of a difference would it really make? I don't know. But it'd be nice to see someone else at the table in the club. Mm. And can the problem solve itself under any other ownership? That's my point. Could it? Could it? Yeah. Yes. And that's an open question. I mean, we don't know yet. We may end up looking at this same dilemma all over again, just under a different name. Only the names of the... Um, Innocent. <laughs> I'm <was laughs> saying changed. the nature of the beast won't change. Right. Just the person who owns the beast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of dilemma, uh, moving on, the the Capitals and Wizards Arena project in Northern Virginia uh, has hit a. I wouldn't even call it a speed bump. Uh, it it's. It's essentially dead right now, unless, of course, uh, Virginia's governor decides that he perhaps wants to uh, hold a special session uh, after the, the close of the General Assembly this year uh, in Virginia. But the interesting thing that The Washington Post is reporting this week is that the owner of Mon Monumental Sports, which, of course, owns the Wizards and the Caps, Ted Leonsis, uh, met with Louise Lucas this week, uh, the the 80-year-old dynamo, uh, the, the senator who is the chair of the Senate Finance and Appropriations uh, Committee with uh, Virginia's uh, General Assembly. Uh, to quote uh, a conversation, uh, Leonsis met with Lucas and said to her, quote, you are a badass, and that she single-handedly prevented this, this arena issue from going into the budget. She was very, very much against it. And this is something that she said uh, just last week. One person should be able to determine whether or not this arena goes In this through. case, yes. Why? because they have the prerogative to do that and because I believe it's in the best interest of the Commonwealth not to bring that arena to the Potomac Yard on the backs of the taxpayers of the Commonwealth of Virginia. She's been against it from the beginning, Sonia. Um, even with all of the fanfare of, of this, this proposal uh, a month ago, you would think looking at that press conference or so with, you know, the governor, Ted Leonsis, and the members of the Alexandria City Council, that uh, this was a done deal and that they would be watching basketball and ice hockey in Alexandria a year from now, a week from now. Yeah, and then look who they failed to talk to from the beginning. Ted Leonsis needed to know that Luis Lucas was a badass from day one mm -hmm. when he was trying to go across the river and take his team with him, okay? And, and to neglect to speak to her spoke volumes about what they thought about her power. And all of that posturing around taking this arena 
to Virginia happened while elections were going on in Virginia, right? So there was a desire to come off to the voters of Virginia, like we were trying to deliver for you. It's not lost on me that while that was happening, they were busy losing the FBI headquarters to Prince George's mm. County, Maryland. So there is pressure on the governor to deliver economic development that can satisfy the voters. And meanwhile, um, Mayor Muriel Bowser here in D.C. was minding her business and hydrating and drinking her water and being un unbothered. <laughs> uh, because again, again, where is the consultation with the black female leadership on this question? I'm not saying that they are misogynist and racist and all of that. Maybe they are. Who knows? But the upshot of it is when consulting the players, was there due consideration for these ladies as players in this decision? And uh, Louise Lucas is absolutely right. Uh, it should be a concern of the decision makers on this about the t load they're putting on the taxpayers. They had public hearings where taxpayers came out and said, why are you putting this on our back? Mm -hmm. That's sta that metro station isn't big enough it's to not, accommodate it's not this. Like that. Nah. And so it's not a surprise to me that Lu Louise Lucas came down hard on her decision about that, despite being complimented as a badass. Yeah. See, Leonce should have looked at what happened when Jack Kent Cook and Governor Wilder went to Potomac Yards and said, we're gonna build a football stadium here. They had a big what to do, and they shaking hands like good old boys. You know, Doug Wilder, he made the governor, so he knows how to play that. No, you gotta know who the players are and who's got the power. She had the power. She can shut that down dead on arrival. And he's just now speaking to her. Uh, the Washington Post article said like he was advised to hold off on speaking to her. His company said that's not true. But he's, he's meeting with all these other people and not speaking to her. And she's, she's shooting it down dead on arrival. It, it's a bad look for him, Leonsis, to just say, feel like he can talk with the governor and not deal with the speaker. Yeah, don't, she, her message was, don't play in my face. Mm -hmm. Which is what sisters do. I mean, come on. Don't play in my face. <laughs> so, but, but it, here's, here's the other thing, and I, and I think one of you, you know, made this point. The reporting last <laughs> month was that uh, Mayor Muriel Bowser and the D.C. Council were blindsided by the Leonsis announcement. And and I think that that's the first thing that's that's not a good look. And th there mm -hmm. are there are multi layers of, of issues with this. The the first one I think is, even though Leonsis has publicly denied it, that this has nothing to do with the the, the issue of, of crime and public safety in Chinatown. Then why were mm -hmm. they telling us about it right before that announcement came out? Mm -hmm. From his point of view, I understand why he wants to go. He's going to have all this land that he can do stuff with. At the um, downtown, it's kind of like shoe on. He doesn't have the same opportunity to grow for his stuff. So just from his point of view, sure, it's a great deal. But, you know, what it would do to the city economically, uh, not so good. You know, Muriel Bowser sitting there, I think she got about 500. 500 million. 500 million sitting there, like you said, drinking. Hydrating. Mind Maybe she say like, I got 450 now, Ted. I mean, I had to, <laughs> <laughs> I had to break 50 over. Do I hear 425? <laughs> 400. But okay, so that's you know that's you know the one thing the 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 unspoken thing about crime and public safety uh, downtown. That's the first thing. But when you talk about land at Potomac Yards, I mean, have you been over there recently? You know, you talk about even the subway not being ready, but. Alexandria, I don't believe is really ready for that because you know, over in Crystal City, not just down the road, you've got the Virginia Tech campus that's being built there. Mm -hmm. You've got uh, East Coast Amazon or whatever they call it over there. And then you wanna build a huge, not just an arena, but an, an entertainment facility. District. Yeah, an entertainment district. Mm -hmm. right. uh, when you know getting to Pentagon City to catch a sale is already hard enough. Yeah, it's gonna be a hot mess if they if they put that thing in there. That it's already bad over there. Yeah. Which is what the citizenry said over right. and over again, and I think it 
might be best to pause, eat a little crow, and start over. But, but with that said, do you think that if, if this doesn't move forward and if the governor does not decide to have a special sessions or, or something like that, then Ted Leonsis may have to come back to Mayor Bowser with hat in hand. Don't answer that. I'm going to take a break. <laughs> we'll come back and we will talk about that more on the Reporters Roundtable after this break on WHUR and WHUT TV. WHUT is dedicating weekdays at 1030 a.m to bring you the best of our locally produced series, like our arts and artists show, Artico, our energetic music series, DMV The Beat. Get out, when I wrote that song, we were fighting. And stories highlighting the endurance of the human spirit with legacy. He used to say to me all the time, when, I'm, when I die, the newspaper's yours. So remember, tune in weekdays at 10.30 a.m. Howard University Television PBS and WHUR 96.3 are joining forces Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. as we bring you Harold Fisher and the Daily Drum live as we take you inside the stories of the DMV. We've got the experts and the people that matter most to help you make informed decisions for your family and your community. That's the Daily Drum Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. live on WHUT and WHUR better together. Welcome back to The Daily Drum on WHUR, WHUT-TV, and Sirius XM Channel 141. I'm Harold Fisher. We are back at the Reporters Roundtable talking about some of the top stories of the week. My guests are Sonia Ross, Editor-in-Chief of Black Women Unmuted, and Darren Snyder, columnist with The Grio. Before the break, I was asking whether or not you believe that Ted Leonsis may have to come uh, back to uh, Mayor Muriel Bowser, indeed, back to the district, hat in hand, and take the five hundred million dollars. Four fifty. Four fifty. Yeah. Uh, four, is that where we are now? Four fifty. Yeah. If you don't hurry up, yeah, we don't hurry up. Uh, and, and and take that and take that offer. I mean, it, uh, it like you said, sitting back, hydrating, and and waiting. Um, but either way. This appears to have been a really difficult, embarrassing gamble for Ted Leonsis. It's a, it's, it's a plate full of crow to eat. I mean, at this point, mm -hmm. maybe he can get some bennies if he puts some mambo sauce on that crow <laughs> right before he eats it. Uh, but it's got to happen, you know. Um, there's crow to be eaten in Virginia, too, no question, you know. The, the governor and those in power need to acknowledge where their where their um, bennies lie. Yeah, I you think know? he his first move would be to see if maybe what he should do if he really wants to go. He should say like, well, let me put some more skin in my skin in the game, mm -hmm. you know. And so the governor or Leonsis? No, Leonsis. Leonsis. So let me lighten the load on the public. So I'm not asked for 1.5 billion. I don't need that. You know, so he needs to knock that number down and maybe if the price tag is so high, then maybe Sister Lucas will grant him his wish. And the time to say that was when she said $1.5 billion is too much to put on the backs of the taxpayers. So maybe we just weren't privy to the conversation where they came back to her and said, okay, what about this amount or what amount do you think is feasible? And I then think, I think that there. second part, what amount do you think? Because in, in this time of, of high inflation and, and, um, and what did President Biden say last week? You know, the Snickers, you don't even get as, a, a big a bar of as Snickers, big of Snickers and, and, and a half a bag of potato chips. Shrinkflation. Shrinkflation. Yeah, yes. every, everyone is concerned about taxes. Let's not even talk about the whole NIMBY, not in my backyard, right. you, know, you know, disturbing the, uh, you know, the, 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 the peace of, of, of urban Alexandria. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, the, and the congestion. And, 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 and the congestion and, and, yeah, and yeah. noise. But That's let's just, you know, like, like you said, the, the money piece. Mm -hmm. If, if mm -hmm. I, if I lived in, you know, in Alexandria, and it's really tight over there right now anyway. 
But now, if I'm living over there and an arena is coming, uh, e even if it's, I don't know, uh, 500, 500 million dollars instead of 1.5 in taxes that, that I would have to pay my portion of, I would not be happy, particularly if I'm if I'm not a hockey fan and or a basketball the, fan. What is the eminent domain risk here? At what point am I going to be sitting in my house, you know, hydrating and minding my business? Yes, mm. there you go. And <laughs> here they come saying your home is now going to be taken under eminent domain right. for this project. That's exactly. a very real concern. Yeah. Uh, with real estate prices being what they are, can they get comparable house anywhere and can they buy, especially if they're older and they've been in their home for a long time? So so this is this is all the bread and butter concerns of the public that have to be addressed and I don't think they thought about that. These deals are always bad for the people who live in the neighborhood. So mm -hmm. they always get screwed and everything just keeps right on moving. So they'll, they're going to they're gonna take a hit if it happens. Right. The question is, will there be enough money and people behind it would be like, well, y'all just got to take a hit. That's the way it works. Because mm -hmm. anytime these projects come about, the, the, the people who are right there, it, it doesn't imp improve their quality of life. Not at all. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't trust it either, to yeah. be honest. I, I don't know. I, I, I just don't think it's going to happen. But that's just me. Uh, let's uh, move on. Council Member Treyon White, Ward 8 in D.C., uh, owes more than $80,000 in campaign related fines, um, th you know, this, the, the DC Office of Campaign Finance levied 20,000 fine against White and his campaign a treasurer. That was uh, reported, of course, last week. Um, I, guess, I guess my question is, uh, from a news perspective, okay, uh, this is important, but from a voter's perspective, do I care? I mean, do, do I care about, uh, the, these, these are fines. These are not like allegations of theft. Well, it, or, well, the money is not accounted for. So yeah. we don't know if it's just poor bookkeeping or if it's misappropriation of funds. Mm -hmm. So if you're a voter and you have questions about uh, the council member's character, you might say, oh, he knew what he was doing. Um, it, it, you know, these book, these regulations, when you get this campaign money, you have to be meticulous in accounting for every dollar and cent. And okay. so were they just sloppy and shoddy or were they using it on stuff that they're not supposed to use it on? We, mm -hmm. we don't know. Mm -hmm. Sonia. And then people are like, let me look at this holistically. What has he done for our community? And that's where voters tend to put their value. Uh, if that weren't uh, th the that's case, that's what I mean. Yeah. If that weren't the case, then there wouldn't be the legend that was Marion Barry. Um, uh, most constituencies have come to accept that their elected officials, and especially with black elected officials, are going to come under some kind of scrutiny, some kind of review, some kind of allegation, some kind of something. Uh, it, it's playing out. With the Fonnie Willis situation in Georgia, I mean, um, there is an expectation among black constituencies that this person who is in there fighting for me um, might be fighting too hard or might be winning too hard because now they're coming after him or her about money or about personal relationships or about anything that can be exploited. So it's all about the voter's perception of him in a more holistic way. Which How much has he done for us? Well, and that, and that, that goes to to my original question. If, as a black voter who believes that black elected officials are always under scrutiny, under the, micros under the microscope, being attacked, uh, if, I, if I like a Trayon White, then do I say, figure it out, fix it, and keep my community safe? Mm -hmm. Keep the grocery stores in my community, bring jobs to my community. I, I, don't, I don't care about this inside baseball stuff unless, mm -hmm. as, as you suggested, unless this rises to the level of, of criminality, which it has not. As, mm -hmm. you know. But when you say criminality, you know, that's that, that white collar crime, right? 
So, well, yeah, but cro yeah, so, white cro cro but, but, I, I so get it. So this is what I'm saying. So some voters, <coughs> some voters, like you suggest, as long as you're taking care of the, the neighborhood and doing all this fight for me, if you wet your beak a little bit, it don't bother them because they could, some of them feel like that's what y'all all do anyway. That's part of the game. So they're not going to hold it against them. And two things can be true. They could be subject to more intense scrutiny. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they, you know, they're doing a little, you know, like mm -hmm. the one guy, he had, he had like thousands of dollars in his freezer. Yeah. <laughs> Is that Jefferson? Is that yeah. who you're talking about? <laughs> talking about oh, some cold wow. cash. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, I mean, happens. as 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 often as he was criticized, um, Marion Barry, uh, uh, you know, the, the trail was very long on things that they say he did. And when you would talk to voters and the people who loved him, they would say, "But you know what? I got my first job through Marion Barry." And, and, and the and value that, they put the on point. that yeah. is what matters to them. And outside, people can say, why do they keep reelecting this person or that mm -hmm. person? I mean, even it's playing out now with Donald Trump, right? Why yeah. are there so many people who are willing to listen? It is because what they put value on personally means more than what they're hearing about this person. To your point, um, quick story. Uh, being, you know, born here in the district, but having lived in many parts of this country, and would meet people, and would, and, and they'd say, "Well, where are you from?" And I'd say, "Washington D.C." Well, the first thing they talk about is Marion Barry, and they would say, "This, you know, the, the guy, you know, was caught doing, you know, cocaine on camera, on on camera, you know, this woman set him up." So he said the whole bit. Okay. But they would say, why do they keep electing him? And to your point, and not in defense, this wasn't about me defending Marion Barry, this was just about stating the facts. And the facts are, as you said, um, under Marion Barry, uh, so many young people got their first job with the Summer Youth Employment Program. Mm -hmm. A lot of those young people grew up to be adults who became uh, prosperous, and and contributors to the community. Mm -hmm. What he did for seniors to make sure he didn't ask you who you voted for. Right. But if you can't get to the polls, I'm going to make sure you get there. That you know that you get there. When you talk about opening up a DC government contracting to to black con not 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 minority to to black contractors mm -hmm. and you know for construction projects and so to your point um, that that's the why with you know Trayon White I think uh, the jury is still out on how they may feel uh, with this this campaign money and we'll we'll have to see how you know how that works. There, there, there's only one Marion Barry. So. Right, and political mentorship is important. You know, the question becomes who who is there helping to cultivate this young talent in politics? You know, um, Lord knows there is no, enough of a dearth of young people who even want to be involved in politics. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the mentorship is important. The access to institutional knowledge is important. So maybe he, he can get uh, a hold of a good inner circle of wizened advisors. One um, would hope. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, one would hope. And, and like you said, um, the people's main concern is like, what are you doing for the community mm -hmm. over there, east of the river? Mm -hmm. um, your bookkeeping is not our concern, you know. Mm -hmm. That is, that's far down the list of things they care about. Like well, I said, like, inside, yeah. it's inside baseball that I don't think a lot, your, your average voter you know, know, it's like, look, yeah. we like what you're doing. We're glad that you're here and that you are putting yourself out here for us. So just fix that, okay? Just fix that. But whoever's running against him will be making it a, a huge you know, deal. that's going to be a, a huge thing <laughs> yeah. for his opponent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just need to be able to explain it. Mm -hmm. Because, um, as they say, <laughs> keep, keep it simple, <laughs> stupid. If it gets confusing to the voters... I think, yeah. I think one of his people said, like, wow, these, these things, this reporting stuff is really hard, but I'm trying to get it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of money, uh, now that the Secure D.C. bill uh, has passed some of the emergency legislation, still we have to 
wait for Congress to make a decision about what they're going to do about it. But there are several provisions in the Secure DC bill that are happening right now. As a matter of fact, on Monday, the, uh, the fare evaders for Metro will now have to uh, you know, give information if Metro Transit Police ask them. You could be uh, fined $100, could even be uh, under more intense circumstances. You might even be uh, arrested. The fair evasion issue is as old as public transportation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Darren, the you know, WMATA has said that fair evasion has cost them, what, some $10 million? That's a lot of money. I thought they said more than that. Yeah, may, maybe more. Yeah. And millions, millions and millions. Yeah. But, you know, either way, you know, that, that's a lot of money. A lot of this is happening. And do you think this is going to work? Well, I think they said that if you don't want to show your ID, you can just leave. Um, if you don't want to... Uh, I think questioned. that was the original, but you know, I think starting on Monday, you have to you, you be forced to. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough nut to crack. Um, I'm from New York, and you and know, so there you go. we used to jump to turnstiles when I was no, in, not you. Oh, yeah. No, we used to jump to turnstile. Um, recently, I was on the city bus. I was going from Howard downtown to the Marriott, and just jumped on the bus with another guy, and he said no one pays. He rides the bus off, and this is my first time on a, on a Metro bus in a long time. I had my smart trip. I put it, he said, well, people what just doing? get on the bus. Don't ruin yeah, it for the rest of us. People just get on the bus. And um, if, if I worked at WMATA, I'd feel some kind of way. I mean, it's tough. I don't, in New York, they're starting to bring in the, the, the National Guard. Yes, and, they are. They're and down in the troopers. subways, yeah. So I don't think more policing is the answer. Um, they, they're talking about increased um, different types of turnstiles to make it harder for you to just hop over it. I can see that. Um, I think it will deter some people if you know that they can hem you up and give you a, what's a civil citation? Yeah, $100. $100. But but then how would they make you pay it? I mean, it's not like they're going to boot your car. You're riding the subway, Mm -hmm. so you don't have a car. And there are going to be $100 citations stacking up. Mm. until they say, we need to come in here and do something about all these $100 citations and collect that money. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, absent some sort of real enforcement mechanism that they can do anything about fair evasion. And, and I think that's two, two things. I can see, and, and I most certainly hope that this does not happen, but I can see this, see someone attempting to evade fares, you know, after Monday, and getting into a really muscular conflict mm-hmm. with a Metro police officer. Yeah, and that could go left very quickly, and it it would be it would be terrible if. If, if someone ended up getting hurt or even killed, mm-hmm. certainly, you know, the loss of life is one thing, yeah. but, but just the publicity over attempting to find a fix for this yeah. is, is frightening to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I feel for them because it's, it's very tough um, nut to crack. Very tough nut to crack. Where so what else did you, was the you money s- leaking from? Is my question. <laughs> Say again. Where else was the money leaking from the authorities' vote? Uh, yeah. Maybe they need to crack down there also. Mm. Yeah. And when also there's also the discussion about possibly raising fares again, which is you know problematic in and of itself. But you know, Darren. So when did you stop? Uh, <laughs> jumping the turnstile. I turn haven't style. jumped the turnstile in years. Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> not <laughs> since the pandemic, right? Right, not, not since the pandemic. <laughs> and, and and having, and they never fixed it in New York. I think, or no, did they? they? Yeah, they, they're putting in some of these, uh, they still, it's a, it's a major issue in New York. It's not just New York and D.C., though. Fair evasion is, 
you know, if you look at what's it's going a, on, it's it, a you thing. know, it's, it's it's a thing. People got to get where they got to get, and a lot of them can't afford to pay. Maybe so, there needs to be. Maybe they can look at Chicago and figure it out. Maybe they can look at other cities that have reasonably successful uh, fair enforcement. Hmm. Who are we kidding? They jump in the gate in Chicago. Yeah, I was just kind of wondering yeah. that. Um, <laughs> we're going to leave the I country. Tried. <laughs> we're we're going to leave this country and talk about Haiti. Mm. Uh, the, the the country has collapsed, and it is it is heartbreaking uh, to to watch uh, with the you know prime minister you know resigning obviously gangs running you know running the city um, the there are you know reports that the, you know that the United States is going to send in marines and anti terrorists to to address this but this is I think the biggest and, and worst uh, political tragedy uh, for the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. And I do not see any way out to correct this, Sonia. It's in also very unfortunate that this is happening at a time when the United States already has Ukraine and Gaza sucking up the air in the room mm -hmm. on international relations and policy. So the tendency might be to say, well, we can't get to Haiti right now, which makes it even worse. It, 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 there's going to have to be uh, a better case made for the urgency of response to dealing with, with this situation. And realistically, there should be a global response to this and what's going on there. It's not just the United States. By being a powerful neighbor, um, the United States can't forget that Haiti was one of the first to uh, recognize its independence, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so it's going to take someone making the case uh, globally. There should be a coalition of nations rushing in to help with what's going on in Haiti. But what would that hate look, uh, help look like in Haiti? Exactly, because who's running it? The gangs are running it. The gangs are running it. So you got to talk, it back. and the gangs are saying, like, nothing's happening unless you talk to us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these are armed men, and they've seized power. And generally speaking, armed men who seize power don't give aren't it up. the most, you know, diplomatic. No. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's very sad. That whole, the whole history of Haiti is so sad that the French, France, was charging Haiti, are they still charging them? I don't know. Money, year after year after year for the, its loss because Haiti got its independence, mm -hmm. which is, you know, why Haiti's so poor. And it's, it's, it's tragic. Um, I, don't, I don't know what they could do with that gang situation because yeah. the gangs are not going to just say, okay, he resigned, so we're good. Y'all can do whatever y'all want to do. That's not going to happen. Eventually, some leader will emerge from all of them. It, it, they'll cannibalize each other, maybe, and then one will declare him or herself uh, president. I wonder, though, as this political meltdown continues, let us not forget that on the other side of this island is the Dominican Republic. Okay? And that is a hard border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Uh, the, you know, the, the vacation spot for Americans and others, you, and indeed some, some Europeans as well. Mm -hmm. If the political meltdown continues, what role will the Dominican Republic have to play in keeping the island stable? Because you, you also have uh, Haitians who are not part of the gang, mm -hmm. who have now at the moment nowhere to go. Okay, and so you have you have the gangs, but then you have uh, you know well-meaning Haitians who are just trying to survive day you know day to day. So what is going to happen to them? Uh, are they going to make a run uh, you know for you know for the border? Could we see 
um, a, a mass exodus from Haiti uh, heading to the United States. And then again, like you were saying, um, that could that could be another a big issue mm -hmm. for uh, this administration and and what kind of help could be extended. But isn't it usually the Dominican Republic sounding the alarm saying, yes. hey, come help because yes. this is getting out of hand. Um, so it's sad to say, but there's already a playbook um, for rallying diplomatically and it'll be interesting to see who will respond to what the Dominican Republic puts out. Let's talk a little bit about uh, basket brawl, <laughs> the the fight uh, between oh, uh, LSU and South Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, I you know I must admit, and I, I've said this before, you know, listeners know, viewers know, um, I'm not a basketball fan, college or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Don't watch it, don't care. Mm -hmm. But this. The, this this muscular adversarial throwdown, <laughs> uh, you know the you know you know cl clearing the benches. I mean, you know what did you know what did they say? I you know I I, I went to a boxing match and a hockey match. Hockey uh -huh. game yeah. broke out. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's getting rough. Wake Forest, his coach said a week or so ago about people rushing the floor. Right. You know, afterwards, um, I think some, something something needs something needs to be done mm -hmm. uh, to you know to kind of address uh, the. Uh, the violent competition well, that it we're was the, to it was see. the fans it was the people rushing the floor for me her brother these, yeah these were, her brother, yeah, okay, yeah. Was, her brother. but, but the, this was ladies basketball and, mm -hmm. and La you know the La ladies ladies basketball uh, it was ladies basketball it's yeah. women's basketball mm -hmm. team yeah. the girls were holding their own right, right. but it, right. The, the the real security need is protecting the players on the floor if they choose to fight each other then it should mm. be them fighting each other and and which we don't condone. Which we yeah, do well, not Thank condone. So Unlike the, their coach, the the LSU coach, saying, "I wish he had put so and so." Um, shameless <laughs> plug. My my latest column is up on thegrill.com, addressing <laughs> trashy Ken Moki and classy Dawn Staley. Yes. So give us so give, give the, us the, the fight summary. first of all it wasn't the fight wasn't even that it wasn't, even that, a fight. It wasn't really a fight wasn't there was no, no punches thrown the uh, the south carolina player pushed down the lsu the, player, LSU yeah. player. And, and, and then I mean, you they, know the bench is cleared but there, there was no they damage got it together done. They, I, I'm, th I'm thinking i'm thinking you know that that player should you know, she she try out for the commanders. She, that. Uh, <laughs> that kind of, uh, she's gonna be. She can't play in the next game. She's but uh, you know, her bro the brother, the LSU player, he got on the court and actually put hands on the South Carolina player. Mm -hmm. Then I guess he saw how big he was. She was and said, "Oh, that's good." Yeah, man. I might get mopped but, up right. out here. Yeah. Right. But, <laughs> but the whole court rushing thing—that's dumb. That was dumb. That's dumb. The, the, the way they flood the court, and someone's going to get seriously hurt. We had somebody get mildly, two people, Caitlin Clark got a little hurt, and mm -hmm. the Duke player got a little hurt. Um, that's just a, that's just an accident waiting to happen. Yeah. Yeah, So uh, somebody's going to have to have to say something because, again, uh, the, the, the rushing of the, of the court or field – Mm -hmm. of play, oh, whatever it has to, whatever, you know, players are going to get hurt, people are going to get hurt. Like they say, it's all fun and games until somebody gets hurt. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to quickly move on to this. This has to be one of the most disturbing uh, to me the stories about uh, fake images showing black supporters behind former President Trump at, you know, at the rallies. So, Sonia, here's the thing that bothers me the most about that. It's not the fakes. It's that the, the, the Republican, you know, front runner um, needs to do that. And, and I think when you talk about the, what, what appears to be the racial division, uh, or, 
or lack or, or lack of racial participation in in the Republican Party right now? Uh, what what does that portend for this election and just this country going forward? Uh, what what this says about you know about the Republican Party? There was a story. There was a story I think today about the RNC. Uh, eliminating its minority outreach, mm -hmm. for example. Well, I mean, who believed, first of all, who believed that was real? That one was right up there with the, the blacks love Trump sneakers, right? You don't have a pair? I do not have you a pair. You do not have a pair. I and do and have. Mug shot. Mm -hmm. And mugshot. Yes, and, and the mugshot. Mug I do have Allison Felix sneakers, by the way. Okay. Uh, but that that drew a collective laugh from the black community. Uh, not that black people are monolithic, not by any stretch. It's just everybody looked at that and said, it's a hideous shoe. Mm. And we don't like those things. Mm -hmm. I think Fat Joe had to explain, because he's a sneakerhead and a collector, and he said, yeah, they sent me a pair. I got a pair. But, you know, I... I collect these things. That mm. doesn't mean I like the guy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so it wasn't really fooling anybody. They're going to try it anyway. And as long as they can create the impression that there is that level of support, even a small representation of that level of support, they're going to try it. I mean, there was the, the Black Conservative Coalition. In South Carolina. Uh, yeah, yeah, they came forward and said, look here, you don't need to do this. Don't make it mm. harder for us than it has to be. We're trying. Just mm. stop it. Um, and, and it underscores what they don't know about the black electorate. And it underscores With, and, and the that, need. And, like I said, and, but, and that's my point. Not only do they not know, but do they not, they also don't care. And I think that that is the thing that is is most troubling. So, uh, because if the message is we don't know, we don't care, but now we have polling that black men are are leaning towards supporting Donald Trump. So we're going to we're going to vote for you, even though you don't care about us. Mm -hmm. But that's a routine trope. Yeah. That black men are going to back a Republican. That has been out there for the better part of this century that the black male vote tilts toward the Republican candidate. It was out there before Barack Obama got elected. It's been out there for a long time. You look, and if you look at election returns and breakdowns by demographic, you'll see routinely uh, Republican candidates can draw, presidential candidates can draw a respectable anywhere from 8 to 10 percent, 10 to 12 percent of the black for them of oh, the black okay. male electorate. That's all what I'm right? saying. We spend so much time talking about the black vote for Trump. All right, give them 10%, maybe. That's 90%. 90% um, of the rest of the voters understand, like, that's the anti-black party. I mean, if we're being frank, all their policies, everything mm -hmm. they're for is anti-black. So if a few of us, 10% of us, are drink the Kool-Aid or whatever... Well, that would be the black male electorate because... <laughs> The black women, or the brothers, the black women <laughs> consistently deliver at best single digits. Yeah, yeah well, we're trying to right. keep it, it below 10 percent. Well, uh, we're trying to keep is that before or after you have that camp meeting that, that come to Jesus? You know, like mm -hmm. in Glory, where they were sitting around the campfire preparing for war, uh, have that meeting amongst yourselves and yeah. try to understand it. Uh, but typically it gets down to just the belief that Republicans tend to have economic policies that black men find appealing. Yeah, like you said, that's the trope. That's the trope. That's the, Correct. Yeah. We're, yeah. All we're talking about right. here yeah, are the yeah. tropes. That's yeah. the trope. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, will, I will say this. Uh, when I was covering McCain-Palin and had an opportunity to talk to the handful of uh, black Republicans who were supporting that campaign, uh, it was a small handful. Handful. Mm -hmm. It was a shrinkflation mm -hmm. handful. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, the Republican Party of McCain Palin is not the Republican Party. But see, that's of a, Donald that's Trump. that's yeah. all they want is that small percentage. They want just enough to shave off to make a difference in a tight election. That's yeah. always We're not the problem. It's them white women 
And um, well, yeah, they gotta have those, a meeting too. Those white men, fifty percent of all of them, they the ones. I mean, our little ten percent. Mm -hmm. That's not the. That's not the issue. Correct. Well, we shall see. I'm going to have to let that be the last word. Sonia Ross, Deron, uh, Darren Snyder, I want to thank you both for talking to us and, uh, and chopping it up uh, with these uh, <laughs> really interesting, interesting, that's the interesting word. topics. Interesting, interesting times. Oh, that yeah. is The Daily Drum for this Wednesday, March 13th. I'm Harold Fisher. Good night, everybody.